Well, thank you very much. I, uh, I appreciate that uh, very uh, kind introduction. Tonight, or this afternoon, I should say, uh, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a story about the Arctic and how the Arctic changed from something that the explorers of the 19th and 18th centuries would have been very familiar with to something that is now becoming very different. Um, and I tell it in large part from my own perspective as a climate scientist who was there at the beginning before things really started to change and who for many years was actually a bit of a skeptic on this issue of human-induced climate change. It's not that I didn't believe the physics, okay? We have understood the basic physics between greenhouse warming for a long time. Uh, but for me, it took many years to be convinced that the evidence was there, that the evidence of change that was there. But when I turned, I turned hard, and it was because of the overwhelming weight of evidence. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's the book cover there, and I've come a long ways. Uh, there I was on the uh, left a uh, long time ago, uh, early 20s, uh, better beard back then, certainly a lot better looking, and now uh, I still try to get up into the Arctic when I can. Uh, the young people just go circles around me, but I try to keep up. So every story has a, a beginning, and uh, the beginning of this story is in... 1982. Well, so what happened then? Well, uh, I think probably some of us were back around then. Um, it was still a largely analog world. Oh, we had computers. I was pretty good at uh, programming in Fortran back then. I was uh, just about to graduate uh, from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, not Amherst College, ZooMass, as it was known back then. Maybe it still is. Um, I was about to graduate as a geography major. I had actually started out as an astronomy slash physics major, but for a number of reasons, and none of them bear any kind of close scrutiny, I decided to go in a different direction. There was this hippie girlfriend I had, which I think figured prominently, but uh, that's a whole other story. But uh, in any case, um, I was about to graduate. I didn't know what I was going to do. I was lost. And I had taken a couple of courses in climate science with this fellow, Ray Bradley. Uh, Ray Bradley is a very, uh, very well-known climate scientist, just a lot of paleoclimate work, climates of the past. And uh, he asked if I wanted to be his field assistant. He'd seen that I'd done well in these couple of courses and shown some interest. And he said, well, I've got some work going on in the Arctic uh, this coming summer, spring and summer. Uh, maybe you'd like to be part of that. And I said, sure. He said, well, you might as well apply to graduate school at the same time. So I said, sure, okay. And uh, so I started to prepare. Uh, I think for uh, many of us, well, 1982, the only, uh, it, it was the year ET came out. That's why I put it there. Um, in any case, uh, still a classic movie. In uh, any case, um, I applied to graduate school, said yes, and by miracle was accepted into graduate school. The day I left, I believe, is when I was accepted, and off to the Arctic. And that was in May of 1982. And uh, this is a shot uh, from our uh, camp that we had back then. This was actually a couple of months into, the, uh, into that first field season. Uh, sometime in July, you can see the snow is melted off of the uh, peaks behind uh, our camp, so it was certainly um, later in the year. We got there sometime in May, when it was still pretty cold. Um, we were flying the Canadian flag, right, As, because we were in Canada, of course. Um, and back then, I mean, field work back then was different than you have now. Uh, back then, it was basically uh, a twin otter, which is a, a twin engine aircraft, wonderful things. They'd land, and they'd dump you with 500 pounds of fu food, some fuel, a two-way radio, and say, see you later. And that was pretty much it. And you were on your own with your gear. So um, what was I doing? Well, I was what Ray Bradley called me. He called me a enthusiastic cub scientist. I wasn't really a scientist back then, right? I was trying to become one, but I was enthusiastic. And what my project was, which was going to become my master's degree, was to test this theory, a local test of this theory of what was called instantaneous glacierization on this pair of small ice caps around what's known as the Hazen Plateau of Ellesmere Island, way up there on Ellesmere Island, the Canadian Arctic, at about 82 degrees north, something like that. 
So what's this idea? Well, there was this theory put out uh, some years before, a guy, Jack Ives, put this thing out. And he was asking, well, how could the great ice sheets of the past quickly grow? Um, and I'm saying quickly grow in a matter of you know, a few thousand years. Things are relative here in terms of quickness. But it had to do with something we call albedo feedback. Albedo is just a fancy word for the reflectivity of the surface. And the idea was if there's this big place up in Canada, the Labrador Ungava Plateau, that sits just above the snow line, sits but just below the snow line is the idea. In any case, the idea here is that if the climate cooled for some reason, for some reason, cool it down a little bit, then summer snow on this high plateau would survive. Some of it would survive the summer, but that snow is white, right? It's very bright, so it reflects most of the sun's energy back into space. It has what we call, let's say, a high albedo, reflectivity. Well, if it reflects a lot of the solar energy back into space, that will cool the climate a little bit further. That means maybe the next year more of the snow survives, so a larger area with a bright surface and so on, and, and, and furthers the cooling. It's a classic climate feedback is the idea. So what I was tasked with doing for my project was instrumenting a couple of uh, little sites on these two ice caps. I think you can see them here. There's a big one there and a smaller one there. The big one is like that little heart shape. Now, these are actually very small ice caps. Uh, the, the biggest one was maybe a mile and a half across, something like that. And we'd uh, instrument these sites. You see like that site called Zebra there. We'd put uh, various thermometers. We'd have things to measure the reflected solar radiation. And we'd compare those values with data collected just off of the ice cap, where it's dark. That's the dark tundra areas. And we compare the climates between the two. And by that doing that, we'd get some idea of how is this little ice cap influencing the local climate. And it shed some light on this idea of, of uh, what we call instantaneous glacierization, that theory. Uh, so what you see here, uh, what, the one you have on the, uh, on the uh, left there, that's an air photo. And that was an air photo that was taken in 1959. Uh, that was taken uh, as part of uh, oil exploration, petroleum exploration activities uh, way back then. And they're doing a lot of mapping. So that's what we were doing. And um, we had a lot of fun with it. Um, that's me making bread, actually, uh, on the ice cap. Uh, it was hard because, you know, it's fairly cold and you're trying to knead bread and you're trying to keep the bread warm so it will rise and things like this. And then you'd have to uh, cook it in what they call a Coleman oven. I don't know if anyone's ever used a Coleman oven, but you have a, these two burner Coleman stoves when you're camping. They'd have this little box you could put on the top uh, and you, supposedly you could bake things in it, right? Well, it was it, like they had three settings like uh, slow, medium, and fast, right? It didn't even have a temperature gauge or anything like that. So it was, it was a lot of guesswork, but we had a lot of fun uh, doing it. So uh, yeah, we'd occasionally have, uh, have some bread. Uh, interesting, these, uh, those little cans there, those are old civil defense uh, water cans. Um, back then, um, you still see them on this building, the civil defense signs, right? You had fallout shelters. And if a, a, a proper fallout shelter might be in a building with a big basement or something like this far down. Um, they would have uh, uh, emergency supplies. And one of those was cans of water, uh, such as those. And we kind of repurposed them. Uh, but it's interesting, you open up these cans, right? And you would look inside, and it would, after the water, it would say to reuse as a commode, right? So the idea is, you know, it's very efficient, right? You drink the water, and then you find other uses for it. But we, we repurposed them for, for our gear because they were, they were quite tough and things like that. Um, and again, that's our tent in the background. That, that was used for both uh, 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 kind of, that was, we have these little tents here for, uh, for sleeping. And the big one on the back, not that big, the igloo tent, that was for uh, preparing food or just uh, hanging about. And uh, you use these Coleman uh, burners, right, these uh, Coleman stoves for uh, both cooking and for heat, right? If it got too cold, you just crank it up. Um, now, we did not think about things like carbon monoxide poisoning back then. You didn't think about these sorts of things back then. Now, at the same time, it was a rather well-ventilated tent, put it that way, so it probably wasn't a danger. But, uh, uh, but you know, here I was 22 years old. What the heck did I know, right? Uh, but we had a lot of fun with it. Well, um, that's just another shot from, uh, uh, from that era. Um, you can see I'm standing on this pedestal of ice. What had happened is we were on the ice cap, and then 
it all melted out around the tent, and so we were kind of on this pedestal of ice, so we kind of had to move it around. So that's, uh, that was sort of the day of moving, uh, moving things around. Uh, and that was actually a very rare, clear day uh, up there. Uh, nice blue sky. Uh, photos are a little bit, uh, little bit washed out in a sense of, of those, the younger people in the crowd may not remember that we used to have this thing called film, you know, that we took uh, pictures with, and you'd have to have process. So, uh, these are my old slides, and I had some of them uh, uh, digitized. But this is a fairly uh, rare, clear day, nice blue sky. Uh, basically, the Arctic is a very, very cloudy place. Uh, sometimes you have nice days, but it's a very cloudy place uh, in general. And we were on the top of this plateau, and so basically we were in ice fog a lot. You know, that was kind of our typical weather uh, back then. Um, just one more, oh yeah, we'd had some nasty weather. That's uh, uh, just kind of a whiteout, uh, and it was just, you know, the wind was really blowing, the snow was coming down. That's an anemometer there uh, that you can use to measure the wind speed. I think it fell over, uh, it was so bad. But, uh, but we thought it was all, uh, all just great adventure, uh, of course. I always liked that one, this, this cloud, boy. Looks like it's sitting right over our little camp. It's actually a cumulonimbus cloud, you know, a thunderstorm cloud, right? But up there, the atmosphere is very, very stable, so these things can't penetrate very high in the atmosphere, right? You hear about these cumulonimbus clouds here when you have these nasty, you know, summer storms. They're, you know, 40, 50,000 feet sometimes. I don't know how high that got, but not nearly. And actually, we got, like, Graupel fell out of it, and we had even a crack of thunder. Odd, 82 degrees north, right? A clap of thunder. Um, it fried one of our instruments. We never thought up in the Arctic you have to ground your instruments. Well, we found out otherwise. Fortunately, these microloggers we were using, they were so primitive. We thought they were high tech at the time, but they were so primitive that I was able to turn it off, turn it on, reprogram it, and we're okay again, right? So uh, thank, thank God for sometimes the primitive technologies tend up working the best, although at the time we thought it was uh, high tech. And that's just one more shot from there at one of these uh, sites that we were instrumenting out on the tundra. And you see those sort of heaves there, sort of heaving there. That's a classic periglacial feature, these sort of frost heaves. It's all a permafrost area, perennially frozen ground. Uh, and again, uh, a fairly rare, uh, fairly rare, reasonably sunny day. Well, okay, so moving on, why were we doing this? Well, it was an interesting idea to look at how these little ice caps were influencing the climate, that idea of instantaneous glacierization. But this was actually inspired by some work, which was greatly overblown by the media, that the climate might be cooling. And Ray Bradley, he was my advisor at this time, and this guy, Giff Miller, they put together this paper uh, that was uh, published in a prestigious journal, and it said the climate warming trend since the 1880s seems to have given away since the 1940s to a cooling trend most pronounced in the Arctic. Right? So we've been warming, then we get to this cooling phase. People are saying, what the heck is going on? There was even some talk, uh, oh, could we be moving into a new ice age or something like that? Now, there was some talk in the science community about that, uh, but uh, people were at the very same time saying, well, wait a minute, we can see that atmospheric concentrations in the atmosphere are increasing. We have the Mauna Loa record, right? It started in 1958. We think things are going to warm up. So there was talk kind of going on both sides uh, at that time. Uh, you see this nice uh, cover from Time magazine, right? How to Survive the Coming Ice Age. It's a fake. It's a fake. I found it online. It's a fake. Um, and I could not trace back the, uh, the provenance of this particular uh, thing, uh, the cover to Time magazine, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming it must have been one of these things that maybe some skeptic or something like this put together, because there were people, you still see them today, saying, oh, you climate scientists, back then you said things might be cooling, uh, and so now you're telling us it's going to warm, so how could we believe anything? So that's all I can imagine, is something like that, but I thought it was uh, rather amusing to find this thing and realize that it uh, indeed is a fake. Um, well, I got a little more uh, experience in the field in 1983 with this guy, Fritz Kerner. He, a uh, famous glaciologist from Canada. Glaciologists, they study ice, right? They study the behavior of how glaciers and ice sheets move and things like this. That's what they do, glaciologists. And I was his field assistant, and we were studying what we call the mass balance of these big glaciers up there, basically whether they were growing or they were shrinking. That was the idea. 
Uh, he was uh, very, very well known. Um, and uh, he was, uh, geez, when I first met him, he looked like this dried up old prune. You know, he, he had been out in the field for so many, 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 many years, right? And I mean, he kept going and going and going for decades. You know, he'd only recently, uh, only recently passed. But uh, an amazing fellow, he was absolutely impervious to cold absolutely impervious. It didn't matter how cold it was, you know. I mean, I went out there, um, I learned all about frostbite because the, they dumped us off on the top of what was called the Devon Ice Cap on Devon Island. It was in early April and it was like minus 40 with a good stiff breeze and I was not prepared for it, right? Uh, fortunately, he, we had extra things I was able to put on and, uh, and, and, and get through it, but uh, to this day, if I go out somewhere, I tend to over dress or I, I bring too much gear because I've been there, right? I had uh, skin peeling off my nose and my ears and my fingers, right? And uh, I, I had this guy, well, I thought, really cool girlfriend, you know, and, and so I went home. I thought, oh, she'd look at me and she'd think, you know, how oh, is the intrepid Arctic explorer. Now, she wouldn't go near me for three weeks, right? So uh, that didn't work out. But uh, uh, in any case, I learned a lot uh, about, well, frostbite, but also more about the Arctic. That's just a shot from back then, kind of uh, washed out a bit uh, on the top of uh, Mer de Glace Agassiz, that was. Um, and that's just one where for people, airplane infectionados, that's a twin otter, amazing things. They can uh, take off and land at about 300 feet, just amazing aircraft. And they're uh, utilized all the time up there. The one that's uh, I show there on the left, uh, I suspect that one is still flying, actually. Incredibly tough airframes, probably still out there. Um, so it was quite the adventure, for sure.